All right, so I just want to say good evening to everybody, and as you can probably tell, it's my turn to take care of our evening services. It's been a little while since I spoke. We did some trading, trading, so it's been quite a while, and I was thinking about what I could speak about all week, and all week I've been getting over what my grandpa calls that 19 thing. So I had COVID, if you didn't know what that was. So I've been, if I don't, if I uh, start coughing or anything like that, you'll have to, you know, forgive me. Uh, but I'm over it. I'm okay now. And I'm really happy that everyone is here tonight. You know, I've been thinking about what I should talk about. And I think that I have something. I think I have it. And it has to be something good when I can use that as my background. <laughs> That's a personal picture. It kind of looks like me. It's not. Not quite as hairy on the arms there. Um, but I think I've got something. And I think that Jill will like my, be my message better than anyone else here tonight. So I'm, I guess I'm just speaking to Jill if no one else. You know, I've taught all kinds of crazy things from the pulpit or down here because I don't like speaking up there. I've taught things like knife sharpening, I have fishing, um, self-defense, many different things. And tonight, we're going to learn about how to choose meat. We're going to learn how to choose what the best meat is. You know, my, I don't know how it works in your house, but my wife does almost all of the grocery shopping. She, we love the Walmart app and the pickup. Because you just go online, you pick it, pick it up, super easy. And it probably saves money because you're not walking through and having to smell all those good things and see all that yummy stuff. But, and I, you know, she has all of the shopping for us for the most part. But every once in a while, I have to go to the store. But I will only go to the store with a very explicit list. No list, no shopping. You can't just tell me I need... Milk, bread, and eggs. No, I want a list because I'll end up getting something stupid. But even when I go to the store with a list, I will probably call my wife 10 times to make sure I get all the right items. You know, my wife must be very pointed and descriptive when it comes to groceries because I will get it wrong every time. And I always seem to pick all the wrong stuff. And, you know, this is probably true with almost every department and every department in the store except meat. You know, and I'm not talking about, you know, choosing chicken or ground beef. That's easy. Just pick up a pack of chicken, pick up a pack of ground beef. And really, it's not that much difference. There's probably a little bit, but not bad. But I'm talking about the good stuff. When we, you know, it's not that we eat it all the time, you know, but when we are going to have a good steak or a good roast, my wife almost always delegates the choosing of the meat to me. And I really hope tonight that there's no vegans, no vegetarians, because we're going to learn about what makes a good piece of meat, what makes a good steak. So we're going to play a game together, all right? So I need your participation, and I'm going to show you a picture. There's actually going to be a couple of pictures, and there's going to be two pictures that pop up, one on the left, one on the right, and we're going to choose what's the better piece of meat, what's the better cut, all right? Does everyone got it? Yeah. Simple game, but let's play. So Michael's going to put the picture up for us. All right, so you got left and right. Who here, so you're facing this way, who here thinks that the right two pieces of meat are the better meat? Raise your hand. All right. If you think the right, the right hand side, this side, is the better meat, raise your hand. Okay, a couple of you guys. Who here thinks the one on the left is better? All right, so if you pick the right, I'm not coming to your barbecue. <laughs> the right-hand cut is flank steak, okay? Flank steak. One of the tougher steaks that you can get, like six bucks a pound. It's one of the cheapest beef cuts and very, very, very tough. You have to be very careful how you cook it. The meat on the left is Japanese A5 Wagyu sirloin. $135 a pound. $135 a pound. Yes. All right. 
So left-hand side, we're not, we're, price is not an option tonight, all right? <laughs> Doesn't matter. We're just picking the best cut. <laughs> Next, Michael. All right. Look on the right and look on the left. So who here thinks the right-hand side, the pack, the pack of meat is better? All right, Kim, I'm not coming to your barbecue. <laughs> who here thinks the left-hand side is better? All right, so the right-hand side, eye of round, one of the other nasty pieces of beef. You, you gotta put it in a, you gotta put it in a crock pot. It's a crock pot beef dish meat. On the left is again, Wagyu, uh, I think it's called a Yamataki or something like that. I had it written down, but I, I lost the description. $130 a pound uh, ribeye. Wow. Okay. And let's do one more. Who thinks on the right? <laughs> Who thinks the left? All right, so we got a chuck roast, which is the meat you, you could, again, you put it in your crock pot and you make sandwich meat out of. And on the other side is another, uh, I believe that's a ribeye as well. And that's about 125, I think it is, dollars a pound. Uh, all the meats on the left-hand side are those real expensive meats. If you ever watch one of those programs where they like massage the cows and like play music for them and I, so I'm serious they like give them like booze to make them like ultra soft they don't let them walk around at all those are really good cuts of meat so there is nothing better than a good steak and a good piece of meat when you get a good piece of meat it's so juicy it's so moist and if you go to the store and you get you know you're looking for a good steak and you get the wrong piece of meat, it's all burnt and dry, right? It's all nasty, disappointing, like chewing, your mouth hurts because you have to keep chewing on it. You can take pictures down, it's okay. <coughs> so the question is, how do we know how to choose the right kind of meat? It's the fat. Fat is where it's at. You guys are lucky. I wanted to play the Weird Al fat song, but I decided against it. Thought it was probably... I already talked about rolling in here and being overweight, so probably not... Uh, I don't want to be too sacrilegious in here. But actually, you want as much fat in the meat as possible. And the truth is that we want as much fat in the church as possible too. And I don't know if you know it, but there is a ton of scriptures that talk about fat. Yeah. It, a ton of them. Psalm 63, 5, the OKJ version, says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Can't forget scripture like Isaiah 55, 2, in the same version. It says, Let your soul delight itself in fatness. So we should be delighting in fatness. But before you go out and everyone goes and cancels their gym membership, please pay attention because we might not be talking about the same kind of fat. Tonight we're talking about fat as an F-A-T. F dot A dot T dot. So I don't care what size you are. I don't care what size your pant size are. Uh, I don't really care what size sweatshirt you wear, uh, but we need people that are f faithful, available, and teachable. Wow. Faithful, available, and teachable. Teachable. This is how God's people are going to fulfill God's calling on the church this year, which I'm going to remind you again, which is found where? Where is it found? Only Leslie and Ben? Wow. Michael's going to come down and beat you guys up. All right, so what is our, what is our calling this year at least? What was it again? There you go. Build his house. Build God's house. I think you guys are all gun-shy choosing the wrong meat. 
throwing down that A5 for an eye of round. But our scripture, again, 1 Peter 2.5 says, And now you become living building stones for God's use <coughs> Excuse me, in building his house. What's more, you are his holy priest, so come to him, you who are acceptable to him because of Jesus Christ, and offer to God those things that please him. You should have that one memorized. And for if you don't, I put up on the screen. It's also in your handouts. But God has called us to build his house this year. God wants us to be building his house in this community. God wants us to be doing new and exciting things and building on the foundation that he's put here for years and years. But you know, God can't build anything. Yes, I said that. God can't build anything. And leaders can't build anything without people that choose to be faithful, available, and teachable. And I want you guys to realize that these three things, being faithful, available, and teachable, are attributes that are not just attributes. They're actual choices. You know, some people naturally have inclinations toward them. There's some people that kind of display those kind of naturally. But they are really built into our lives. They're built into our lives through choices. Just like a good steak doesn't just happen, fat people are built. They're built when, they choose, when people choose to submit to God and when people choose to submit to his house. So the first attribute that we're going to talk about tonight is faithful. Fill in the blank is faithful. God needs men and women that are full of faith. You have to be full of faith if you want God to use you to build his house. But the world and the worldview has really distorted the word faith. It's distorted what faith really means. And when we talk about being faithful, it is more than what the world thinks that it is. Faith involves more than just a belief. Faith is a choice and faith is living out your beliefs through action. You have to live out your faith through your actions. James 2 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith involves more than just a belief. The world has told us that, oh, I have faith because I believe in God. Oh, I have faith because I believe in Jesus. Oh, I believe he's a good guy. But that's not faith. That's not true faith. Faith involves, just like we read, action. If there is no action in that faith, that faith is dead. It's worthless. (coughs) Hebrews tells us, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as it is in the habit of some are doing, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I don't know if you caught how many action words in there. We have to stir, not neglect, meet, encourage. Those are all things that require actions. And going to service is great. Going to services tonight is great, but it's not enough. Just going to church or believing in God and going to church is not enough. God's faithful take an active role daily to grow his kingdom. They are the faithful to serve and not just be served. You know, there's so much to do in God's house that really we can't accomplish it every week. Because people are too thin to show up. There is something every week that gets left off that we can't do because we just don't have enough people to do it. Every week, without fail. You know, please don't take me wrong. Many of us serve, and many of us serve a lot. 
But if I was asked a question to you guys tonight, it's hypothetical, not like our choose the meat, you don't have to raise your hand. But if I was asked the question, do you do enough? How many could honestly say that they do? How many of you could honestly say, yes, I do enough. I don't need to do any more. I couldn't do a better job. Do you daily serve God in his house? You know, Michael, when he was reading this, he said, hey, you got to actually follow this as well. But it's, the truth is that I'm just as guilty as the next person. If I was to ask this question to myself, I would probably have to say, you know, I could do more. There is something that can be done. I can do it better. I can do it more. I can give more time. I could trade something I want to do. <clears throat> I would have to answer it probably the same as many of us in this room, if not all of us. Faithfulness involves work. Working hard with all of your might in order to prove your faithfulness to the Lord. So many people consider themselves faithful because they believe, but they are nowhere near faithful in the way that they act, their out, act out their faith. So many of the world's faithful people or faithful Christians are only Christian or only faithful in the world, in, the wor in, in word. Only faithful in their beliefs that are in their head and not in their actions, not in their works, and not in how they're living their lives. You know, there's, this type of faith is talked about in the Bible. If you look at James 2.19, it says, you believe there is one God. How many of the world would say that today? The majority of the world would agree to that. That's good, James would say. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Just believing in God is not of any benefit to you. The demons believe in God. The, de the demons believe in God probably stronger than you do. Yet, do we think that the demons are faithful? Would we call them faithful? You know, really it's sad because the supposed Christians don't even shudder. They think that their belief is enough to get them by. They think that just believing and just having that head knowledge is enough. Maybe attending a service. I've heard people tell me that, oh, I'm a faithful attendee. Oh, how fun do you go? Oh, at least once a month. <laughs> I go three times a year. I go every funeral that I know. <laughs> I go into a church. But this is what we have accepted as faithful. Now, I know that us here tonight going to Sunday night service would not be in that same boat as, oh, I'm faithful because I go once a month. You guys are coming on Sunday nights. But again, if I ask the question, are you doing enough? Are you living out your faith? Is your faithfulness enough? I know I couldn't say that it is. I don't... Excuse me. Never think that you're faithful enough to get by. If you fall into thinking that, oh yes, I'm faithful enough, if you have to qualify it with that word, you are not on the right track. You're not on the right track if you have to say and qualify your faithfulness with enough. Because there's not enough faithfulness in your life. So we're going to talk about the second thing that we're going to talk about. The second attribute is available. And available, <coughs> excuse me, available is one of those things that I think hits us the hardest. This is one of the areas that so many Christians slip up. This is a hard one for so many of us. Available seems to be one of the easiest ways that the devil messes or tempts Christians, uh, Christians up, especially when they start getting fat. It seems like the devil tempts people with their availability the second that they step up for Christ. The second that <clears throat> many Christians step into leadership roles or take a more active role in their church or take a more active role in a ministry or in their families, 
this seems where they hit, get hit the worst. So do you guys think that it's a coincidence that most sporting events and other events are held on Sundays? And even if an event is not held on a Sunday, how many of them are so late on Saturday nights that they prevent church attendance on Sunday mornings? Maybe it's not sporting events, but concerts. If it's a Saturday night, it's so late in the middle of the night when you get home, it's two or three in the morning and you just got to sleep on Sunday morning. Oh, I'll hit the next service. Oh, I won't go to Sunday school. You know, and I, I don't care about sports. I never have. I, I've never been a sports guy to watch sports. But so many times I have been tempted to not go to services or not follow through on commitments for God and for the church with availability. You know, there's always something that seems to be more important. There's always something that seems, oh, it's just this event that comes on Sunday or, oh, I need to go out of town for this thing on Saturday. And, you know, it's sad because even our own families will tempt us if we are not careful for our availability <clears throat> to God when we start stepping up. You know, <coughs> excuse me. I have missed so many family birthday parties. I've missed so many trips and events because my family and my wife, we have made a decision and we've made a commitment to our church and we've made a commitment to God. I can't tell you how many things have been planned on during services that we can't go to or that are between services where we might not make it back. For the most part, we don't go. You know, and I'm not saying that you can't miss services here and there, but the question is, are you available for God? You know, I know things happen, but are you available for God to use? Are you available to be a use for God? Sometimes we have to be willing to not take that promotion or not take that job. Sometimes we have to be willing to stop doing things that we love if we're able to produce fat for God. Sometimes we have to give up on those things that we really, really, really want to do. I know I've talked about things in the past that I've had to not do because it would take away my availability for God. So many events or practices and I know that for my kids, too, they've had to miss out on sporting games. They've missed out on events and different things because it's important that we have to be available for God to use and for God to use us to serve others. You know, just a little while ago, I said that going to church was not enough. So it's not just going to services. But I would question you tonight and make you question yourself, really, if you are missing any services, if you're missing Sunday school, Sunday mornings, evening service, Wednesday nights, if you're missing those services regularly, I would suggest you to start looking at your availability tonight. Again, I know God, you know, wants us to work and God gives us the jobs that we have. I understand that. And I'm not telling you that God has not told you to do those things. But I'm telling you, if you're missing services regularly for leisurely activities, I can pretty much guarantee you're wrong. But you need to take a look at your life and ask God, not me, but ask God, am I available? Am I doing what you want? Am I where you, that you want me to be? I know that God wants us to work. And, I understand, and God understands that you have to work and he blesses you in your work. So one of the first things that God instructed man to do was work, actually. In Genesis chapter 2, God says, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. God blesses our work. And working is not just a command to Adam. The Bible says we are akin to the devil if we don't work. Did you know that? It literally says that we are kin, as in family, to him. 
Proverbs 18.9 says, Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Wow. So if you are not working, you need to find a way to work. And especially if you're not working in the church, if you're not serving, you need to be finding a way to serve. Make yourself available to do that work. God's pretty strict on it. And of course we have the scripture that says, for when we are with you, we would like to give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. God is stricter than we are. God expects work from his people, both in the world and in the church. But are you available to do his work in the church? You know, I think it's funny, and it's, well, it's not really funny, but it's amazing how God brings messages and God brings ideas together. It was funny because Michael preached this morning, and I was thinking about how well his message this morning went with today. I could have stolen a whole lot of his scriptures and a whole lot of his points, but, and I've read and heard the scripture, one of the scriptures he used this morning, but I've never heard it in the version that he read it in, and I think it fits so well with our point tonight, that I decided to use it. Matthew 10, 21 and 22 in the message. When people realize it is a living God you're presenting and not some idol that makes them feel good, they're going to turn on you. Even people in your own family. There is a great irony here, proclaiming so much love, experiencing so much hate. But don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it in the end. If we make ourselves available and do the work and be faithful to that work, God tells us that it's worth it. And I know that it's worth it. And the, but I think it's funny in the scripture that says that when we present the real God and we present not just an idol, but the true God that's not just here to make them feel good, they're going to turn on you. The devil will use anything he can, anything he can as a foothold into our lives. The devil will use our hobbies, our interests, our own desires. If he can use that as a foothold to get into your life and to speak into your life, he's going to use it. So if the devil will use what we want, don't fool yourself into thinking that he won't use your family to attack either or your family to be a foothold into your life that would cause you to lose your fatness. Trust me, it will feel like an attack when you step up and say, no, I can't make that party. I can't make that Christmas or event because I'm going to church. And maybe it isn't just a service, but maybe a commitment that you've made to God. Go ahead and tell your family or friends, no, you're not going to clean, you're not going to go do whatever it is they want to do because you've got to clean the church and see how far that goes over, how well that goes over. Hint, lead balloon. Doesn't go so well. When he says, I made a commitment, I've got to go clean the church. Trust me, I've heard them all. Let someone else do it. Why do you always have to do it? I made a commitment. That's my job and that's what God wants me to do. You know, and it's, it's hard to be available for God. Yeah. It's hard to make those decisions. The decisions we have to make often are hard. Yeah. It's a sacrifice, correct. But maybe this isn't an issue. And if, and if you're thinking tonight that, well, that never really happens to me, I, ask, I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. So if you're thinking, eh, not really a problem I have. I don't experience it. My family doesn't really have that. I don't really have those problems. I want to ask you a couple of questions. One, the first question, is, is it because no one is attacking you because I give in too often? I don't put up a resistance. So there's no, going to be no resistance from the other side. And two, have I not made myself available for God to use in the first place? Because I guarantee you, if you don't have scheduling conflicts, 
I would guarantee that 90% of the time that you are too available to the world and not enough to God. Because when you step up and decide to be fat, you're going to have scheduling conflicts. You're going to have to cost something. Like Michael just said, there's going to be a sacrifice. If there's not a sacrifice, you're probably not doing enough. You haven't stepped up enough. I know it's been said many times that if you're not here for a service, your presence should be missed. Something should be, not that no one can be not replaced or anything like that, because all of us, God can use anybody and God can replace any one of us, but you should feel, the church should feel a missing. This thing didn't happen. That didn't happen because you have jobs and you have responsibilities. If you could not show up tonight and I wouldn't know any different, that's a problem you need to be talking to God about. You need to become faithful in your works and you need to become available to God. You need to be willing to give and sacrifice whatever it takes to follow Christ. Luke 14 says, But now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. See? Jesus is a lot stronger than me. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count out the cost, whatever, whether he has enough to, to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and it is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him. There is always a cost to serve. Every time. And if there isn't a cost, then you aren't serving. And we have to be willing. We need to be willing to pay the cost. And if that cost is sports, if it's concerts, hobbies, or maybe it's scorn from your family and friends, pay it. It's worth it. We know that serving God is worth it. But he tells us, and he tells us over and over again about the blessings that you'll get, about storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. In Matthew it says, But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. The things that we do and build up for God and his kingdom and through his church are the things that will actually give us benefit in the end. I can guarantee you that if you miss a concert, if you miss a family event, you're not going to remember it in 10 years probably won't remember it 10 days from now if you're like me but when you serve God and you're faithful and you make yourself available to him to do his work I guarantee you you're going to remember those things and God's going to remember those things it's only through those things that God can bless you and trust me God's blessing is a whole lot better than seeing whoever the next major up and coming artist is See, God is going to repay you abundantly for any cost that you pay up front to serve him. God is going to repay you in so many more ways in blessings here on earth and in heaven. So after you become available, you become faithful and you become available, the next thing we're going to talk about is teachable. Become teachable. We must be teachable. You know, the truth is that it won't do us any good if we're faithful and even if we've made ourselves available if you're not teachable. You have to be able to be teachable to really produce the type of life that God can use. So some of you may know this, but one of my big jobs at work or my main responsibilities, is I'm a trainer. At my secular job, 
I set up the training for the entire department. I wrote a training program for the lottery's proprietary software and ticket ordering. The department that I work for makes the state billions of dollars in sales, with a B, every year. And all of those sales, all of that, and that department helps fund the California state school system. And I think I do a pretty good job at the training. But I want to ask you guys a question. Do you guys want to know the number one thing that contri contributes to an employee's success? What do you think the number one thing when I go to train somebody, if I know they're going to be successful or not? And I know pretty quick that they're going to be successful in that job. What do you think it is? There's, there's important. But do you think it's ability or skill? It has nothing to do with their resume. It's nothing to do with their skill. Nothing to do with their background. None of those things. It, has, it, it all has to do with their willingness to be teach, teachable. And you know pretty quick when you spend hours with somebody whether they're teachable or not. You see, at my work, I know the job inside and out. Nobody knows the system more in depth about what we do than I do. That's not bragging. It's just the truth. Yet, sometimes people uh, think that they know what to do to be successful. They think they know the answers. And I tell each and every new hire, I tell them the exact same thing. I don't care what you come from. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what your ability is. If you will listen and be willing to do what I say and what your supervisors tell you, you're going to be successful here. If you're going to be teachable, you will succeed. If you're not teachable, you're going to have a hard time. You know, and the truth is that it's not just in the job place that this is true. Actually, what I'm talking about is a biblical pr principle that I borrowed for my secular job. And God has called each and every person who follows him to be teachable. It tells us all throughout Scripture. Read through Scripture. Look through Proverbs. Look through Psalms. Look through all of the different places that the Bible tells us how to be successful in life. It will tell you to be teachable, to have faithfulness, be available to God, and to be teachable, have a teachable attitude. Proverbs 9 tells us, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and your years will be added to your life. If you are wise... Your wisdom will reward you. If you were a mocker, you alone will suffer. How many times in Scripture do we hear of people being ruined because they're not teachable? Read through the, the, the books and kings and the list of kings and saying, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and they were a terrible king, and they died a horrible death because they did these horrible sins. Then his son did the exact same thing because he was just as dumb as his dad. And then his grandson was just as stupid as his grandpa and he did <laughs> stupid things and, you know, he got killed too. Yeah. Yep. It's story after story after story. Then you come to one that says, but there was so-and-so. And he listened to the laws and decrees of the Lord and he's successful. The difference between the unsuccessful king and the successful king, he was teachable. Right. He listened to what God said. He put people around him that said what God said. And he listened to those people. With the scripture I just read to you in Proverbs 9, where it says, if you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you, will alone, you alone will suffer. The word mocker is sometimes translated as scoff. If you scoff, you're going to suffer. But how many times have you scoffed when hearing a sermon? Or when you hear teaching, go, pfft. I don't need to listen to that. I already do that. Eh, not a big deal. Maybe you scoff tonight. I don't know. But if you did, you're going to suffer. <laughs> but how many times have you scoffed scoff when hearing those type of things? Or when a leader tells you something? Is that just me? I've done it. Maybe I'm the only one I'm willing to admit it. But every time you walk away from biblical advice, 
Every time you don't heed counseling from a leader, biblical, biblical advice or biblical counseling, you are scoffing. You are setting yourself up when doing this for suffering. You know, I know pastor has a background and a heart for counseling. He has the training. He has, he has counseled many, many, many people. And, you know, I've been the benefactor to many of these counselings and his services. But I know that pastor could tell you story after story after story of people who were unwilling to listen or change and the, from what he said and the consequences that they had to endure. I can guarantee you there's stories of lost wages, there's lost jobs, there's lost families, there's lost ministries, faith, you name it. I can guarantee you that people have had to go through that because they were unwilling to be teachable and to listen to what the Bible said. I laughed earlier when Michael and I were talking, and I remember somebody calling me a Bible-using jerk. Yeah. <laughs> he said, you're just a Bible-using jerk, because he was using Scripture to argue with somebody. And really, it wasn't an argument. It was him teaching them, saying, this is what the Bible says. This is what you need to do in your life. And they couldn't argue with that, so they said, you're just a Bible-using jerk. How dare you use the Bible? Well, what else should you use? <laughs> what, what, what do you want a past, What do you want any Christian, let alone a pastor, to argue with or tell you and speak into your life? We have to make sure that we have not only an open ears but an open heart. We have to make sure we have an open heart, especially when we disagree. Ezekiel thirty six twenty six says. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel's exhortation should be your prayer. Don't allow your stony heart to keep you from being teachable. The truth is, you are inherently evil and pretty stupid. I know that I am. And I think that we all are. We're inherently evil and pretty stupid. If I was to do everything that I thought was right, I guarantee you I would be in a very, very, very bad place. Because, again, I'm inherently evil and pretty stupid. Don't believe me? It's in the Bible. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Why would God have to tell us to make straight paths and to not lean on our own understanding if we would make the right choices? Nowhere in the Bible does it say, do your best. Live the best you can, do your best, try real hard, and you'll be okay. If you find that scripture, please stand up. I will give you the time. You can, you can share it with me. But it's not there. I've read it cover to cover a couple times. Couldn't find that scripture. But that's how the world lives. That's how we live. Not just the world, but that's how Christians live. I'm doing my best. Only God can judge me. <laughs> I'll try real good. I'll say sorry on my deathbed. And I know those kind of things are kind of funny. We, you know, I'm joking about them. But that's how so many people, even people in the church, live. They live that they're not teachable. They're not fat Christians. They're not faithful. They're not going to make themselves available. And even if they are faithful and available some of the times, they're stubborn. They're hard-headed. They don't want to listen to the leadership. They don't want to listen to what Scripture has to say. They don't want to listen to those things. And they're putting themselves in such harm's way, in such a wrong place, <clears throat> that I don't know, and I don't know why, other than they're just following their own inclinations. It's not even the devil sometimes that messes us up. It's our own selves. Because we're inherently not going to make the right choice. Consult scripture. Consult leaders. That'll help you. Be teachable. If you are trusting in your own self, I guarantee your path is going to take you in the wrong direction. And if you find yourself in the wrong place, in any area of your life, it's because you made bad choices. It, you know, you think, people think that consequences are, oh, this just happened, I got a you know, wrong, you know, bad hand. But it's not true. If you're in a bad place, it's because you made choices 
to be there. Somewhere you made a choice to do something that left Christ's plan and place for your life, and you chose your own understanding over Christ's commands. I know bad things happen to good people, but that's not what I'm talking about. There's choices, and being teachable is a choice. Being willing to be teachable is a choice. And really, we need fat people in this church. We need this church full of fat people. We need to see that fatness being lived out if we want to fulfill God's calling to build his house. But I can't just leave you with fat. I'm going to give you a bonus point or two points. We need to get fatter. Not only fat, you want to get fatter. And yes, I misspelled it. It's a South Sac spelling of fatter. There's supposed to be two T's, but we just, you know, I want to make it easier. We're only going to have, what, four points? Four, po- four and a half points instead of five or six. And the ER is excellent and righteous. Not only do we need to be faithful, we need to be available, we need to be teachable. We need to be a people that are excellent and righteous, who are focused on excellent and righteous and doing excellent and righteous things. This is what we're supposed to be focused on as we're living out that faithfulness. Philippians tells us that finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. If you are focused on all of those things and doing all of those things, you're going to bypass so many problems in life. If you're completely and totally focused, not in the back of your mind, but in the forefront of your mind, if you are looking at whatever I can do that is excellent and what can I do that is righteous, you're going to start living out that fatter life. Faithfulness won't be such an issue. Availability won't be such an issue. Being teachable won't be an issue because you're going to be focused in the right place. It's hard to lose sight if you have the right thing in focus. You're not going to get lost. You have to make sure that you're focused on the right things. And we need men and women that are willing to serve, that make themselves available, that are teachable, and focus on righteousness and excellence. So you know how to choose a good steak? That's how I started. It's the exact same way that you choose a good Christian. Marbling. There's marveling on a good Christian. Look for the fat, not just just on the outside, on the surface, but look at the meat. Look inside the meat. Look inside their lives, and you want to see that fat growing on their lives. You know, look at the meat of someone's life, and look at the meat on your own life. Do you see faithfulness? Not just on Sundays. But how about Thursdays when we clean the church? That's where you start showing the fat. It's not just going to services, but being there for all the extra. Can you see availability for serving Christ? Do you see that availability for serving Christ? That's where the marveling starts to show itself. When we have something going on, who shows up? Who are the people that are always there or almost always there? That's where you start seeing marbling. Are you teachable? When Michael, our leader, speaks, do you make changes in your life? Are you the same as you were a year ago? Or has what God's spoken into you these last months, years, made a difference in your life? That's the type of fat and the type of marveling that Christ wants. This is how we choose leaders in the church. This is how you see people being changed and living out what we're speaking every Sunday. You see changes in their life. That's how you know your life is being, is you're being the right type of Christian, that you're being the right type of person that God can use to build his house. 
God won't choose bad material. God's not going to choose an unmarbled steak. He doesn't have to eat on a budget like we do sometimes. But what do we offer him with our lives? What are we allowing to go on in our lives that doesn't make us good service? They're good servants. God and his church need people with some marbling. God cannot use skinny people because they're always at the gym when he needs them to work. (laughs) I really hope you're not missing church to go to the gym. Trust me, God wants you the few extra pounds. But you can't carry the load if you're not strong enough. So I hope tonight God has talked to you and maybe he's shown you where you're a little tough (laughs) and maybe you can be a little bit better. Choice for God. USDA, you know, choice. So hopefully God has spoken to you, but this week I really want you guys to be praying and asking God how to make yourself fatter, where it is in your life where you've gone wrong, that you're not faithful, available, and teachable, and where you can focus on that excellence and righteousness. So with that being said, let's just bow our heads and pray. God, we come before you right now, and I thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together. God, I know we had fun and we joked a little bit about being fat, but God, I pray that the people of this church and people of Abundant Life, that we would be faithful, God, we'd be faithful in not just our beliefs and not just what we say, God, but in our actions to you. God, I pray that you would convict anyone if they're not being faithful, God, enough, God, or they're falling into that temptation. God, I pray that you would be with them and that you would speak to them today. God, I pray that we would be always available to do whatever you is that is that you've called us to do, God, that we would make ourselves available, God, that we'd be willing to pay the price, whatever it is to serve you, that we would gladly lay it down, God. And I just pray that you would be faithful as I know you are to pour out your blessings on the people for that. God, I pray right now that we would be a teachable church, God, and every, each and every one of us as individuals and as a group, God, that we would always be listening to what you've called us to do, God, that we'd be showing fruit for you, God, because we'd be teachable. God, if we're not listening to you, God, and and we're not where we need to be, God, I pray that you would convict us today, that you would show us what it is that we need, God, and that you would pour into the leadership of this church, that we would have the right words to say, God, and we'd have the right instructions to give to help. God, I just pray that you would help us to focus this week on whatever is excellent and righteous, God, as you called us to do. And God, I just pray that we would be building your house this year. And God, we just love and ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.